Formula One suspension is incredible, carrying 900 kilos of car at over 200 miles per hour. Over curbs, up au rouge, whilst loaded with over five tons of peak downforce. But why do they all use the same suspension setup with this double wishbone solution? In road cars, there are loads of different suspension setups. So why do F1 cars exclusively use this layout? Let's get into it. First, what are the various suspension layouts and why are each of them used in different road cars? Well, here are all the main suspension layouts. Now, with all of these layouts, F1 cars for the past few decades have stuck to using only one. But first is rigid axle suspension. You see this mostly on off-road vans, trucks, and some small hatchbacks. It's where you have the rear wheels of the car linked with a solid axle. Sometimes these have drive shafts inside, making it a live axle, or they're unpowered, making it a dead axle. These can be sprung with coil springs, leaf springs, airbags, or torsion bars, depending on the type of vehicle. The setup is simple, cheap, and can carry heavy loads whilst remaining stable. But it does have a couple of drawbacks for suspension dynamics. First, there is a lot of unsprung weight. This means that the suspension has to work harder to control the wheels over bumps and at high speed. Second, when one wheel encounters a bump, the other wheel also has to move with it. So you can end up with positive camber when you hit a bump in a corner. And as we learned in a previous video, race cars need negative camber for peak grip. So positive camber in this scenario is fine for a truck, but not really for a performance car. The second suspension type is independent suspension. And as the name suggests, this fixes the last drawback of rigid axles, where each wheel and tire can move independently and so produce more grip. But it does cost more to produce and there are more complicated parts required. And in most road car production, everything comes down to cost. But these setups do allow for far more control of the wheel geometry through every attitude of the car. So over bumps, with body roll and in different loading scenarios. And you'll find this setup on luxury road cars or anything with a focus on ride quality. The next suspension type is the trailing arm and it's used as it's incredibly simple. It pivots around the front of a trailing arm and is used as it's very compact and can carry high loads. Again this is another setup that is only used on the rear wheels. Then for the front wheels one of the most common setups is the McPherson strut. This is clever, cheap and compact as it uses the coilover spring or damper setup as the upper arm of the suspension. So the coilover is not only supporting the vehicle load, but is also playing a part in supporting the lateral load on the suspension. And on balance, it's the cheap and simple setup that performs pretty well. You're gonna find this on most road cars, even up in some sports cars and supercars. It's easy to package in a car. It does require the vertical space for the coilover, but it is compact widthways, leaving loads of space for the engine and gearbox in a front-engined car. The next setup is multi-link suspension, which is similar in the layout, but has additional links to support the top of the upright, rather than how a McPherson strut relies on using the coilover or damper. These setups can be stronger, more tunable, and provide more grip in high-speed situations. There are opportunities to tune the camber, toe, and stiffness through different situations. These are common in most road cars these days, but also in performance cars hot hatches, fast saloons, even the previous generation of the Porsche 911. Then there is double wishbone suspension. This is a strong but more complex setup. You have two full suspension arms, given the name wishbones, down to their shape. Then you have the spring and damper either connected to the upper or lower wishbone. But in road cars, normally the lower wishbone for packaging reasons. Now, this sort of setup is more expensive to produce. It can be complicated and takes up more space in the car, but it does provide provide full adjustability, superior camber control through the suspension's travel and provides more control over the suspension geometry, exactly what you want for racing. You'll find this in sports cars like the Mazda MX-5, Alpine A110 and in the new Porsche 911 GT3, as well as most top-end supercars. So why do suspension setups vary so much between road cars and race cars? Well interestingly, on the many, many race cars that are based on road cars, they use McPherson suspension. For example, Touring cars, GT4 cars, GT3 cars. Many of them use a very roady setup that's beefed up and tweaked to work on a racetrack. But open-wheel race cars, F4 cars up to F1, 
Indy cars, things like that, all use double wishbone suspension. And the main reason for that is packaging, but we'll get to that later. The next biggest reason is weight. Road car suspension needs to meet a completely different set of requirements than race car suspension. It needs to be cheap to produce, cheap to service, last for 25 years, carry heavy loads, work on all four roads, and provide great ride quality. Whereas race car suspension focuses on being light, aerodynamic, strong, and ultimately working to create as much grip as possible. It's there to hold the tire in exactly the orientation you want for peak grip, as more grip equals a faster race car. And the double wishbone suspension allows for this, as well as loads of other benefits. For example, the different lengths of wishbones, upper and lower, can be tuned to produce the optimum camber gain under dive. So basically when the front of the car drops down under braking. We spoke about that in this video up here, where we spoke to an F1 engineer. But simply when the suspension compresses, you get camber gain. Look at this shot here of the Alpine A110. You can see how the camber of the tire changes as the car rolls. In performance cars, it's crucial to get this right, as it means the car maintains its peak grip under braking, turning and throttle application. And a double wishbone suspension makes all of this possible. So what if F1 tried to use something else? Well, the reason why every single seater uses double wishbone suspension soon becomes clear. For example, live axle suspension is ruled out down to weight and handling characteristics, as these cars need maximum control over wheel geometry, so the suspension must be independent. Narrowing the choice down to McPherson, multi-link, independent, trailing arm, or double wishbone. Next is that with open wheelers, the wheels are a long way from the solid places to mount the suspension. In a road car, there are more mounting points forward, backwards, and above the wheel. On an open wheeler, the only mounting points are inboard from the wheels. So that rules out McPherson struts, as there are no mounting points above the wheel. And it rules out trailing arm suspension as well. So now we're down to multi-link, independent, or double wishbone. The next thing is loading. Formula One cars can carry insane loads. The 900-ish kilos of the car, two plus tons of downforce, then add in the shock loading of bumps and curbs or rotational loads like braking and acceleration. And that's the key here. These individual suspension members sometimes experience many tons of loading, with braking, of course, being the highest loading scenario. These cars decelerate at up to 6G. So imagine the compressive and tensile forces going through each of the suspension members. These loads would then mean that you have to beef up the suspension components adding more weight to the system. So choosing the strongest possible layout means you don't have to make each part quite as heavy. And that's why race cars landed on the double wishbone. It's adjustable, simple, and strong, but it also comes with other benefits. For example, aero is king in F1, and suspension can actually get in the way of what the aerodynamicists ideally want. So using the simplest, thinnest suspension members helps to keep them happy. And on a side note, you'll notice that F1 cars have oval-shaped aerodynamic wishbones to further reduce turbulence from the suspension, which were even more aero over a decade ago. In Formula One, these are custom-made, super strong carbon fiber wishbones, but in lower formula, these are high tensile steel tubes, with aero covers made out of carbon covering them. Then there's one final element, packaging, which is essentially how you can fit everything in the car efficiently. These Double wishbones allow for push rods or pull rods. Let me explain. If you look at some simpler race cars, for example, a Skip Barber or a Catrum, they have double wishbone front suspension. But the coilover shocks attaches to the bottom wishbone and is out in the airstream. But for Formula One cars or other single seaters, this could cause an issue with the complex aerodynamic packages, as well as a bit of drag. So the engineers put the springs and dampers inside the car. On a Formula One car, these are normally torsion bars at the front, which are tiny steel bars that twist and act like a spring, as these are obviously easier to package. But in the past, they were coil springs. With these inside the car, they are out of the airstream but then they need a system to transfer the load from the wheels. So engineers use a rocker and pushrod system. What do they do, the pushrods? Many things. The load comes up through the pushrod, turns the rocker, and then pushes on the spring and damper. It's a very neat mechanical solution. And they can also pull the spring in a pull rod system as well. And you'll see a pull rod double wishbone suspension on most of the current F1 cars. We spoke to an ex F1 engineer in this video and he explained every setup parameter on an F1 car and how F1 engineers tweak them to make a car as fast as possible. You can watch that here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.